Uh, Jim, thanks for being here. What year did you arrive at SA? 1963. And then what were the circumstances around your arriving here? Uh, it's a, an example of God's great providence. Uh, for the first time, year in my life ever, I went to a boys' camp in Maine because I was sick and tired of teaching summer school and going to school. So I ended up in Maine. Cliff used to set up the tutoring program and then go sailing. And he used to come to camp to pick up his mail, and I used to tease him all the time about how I was going to bring the JV basketball team out and beat them again next this year. And that went on, and then right before camp ended, before he was leaving, he said, I want to sit, and I'd like you and Patty to come up and before we leave, leave. And when we went up, he said, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to have you come to Swickley Academy, which threw me for a loop because I was teaching upper-level classes at Shadyside. Mm -hmm. There were no AP classes or anything like that at Swickley. It only went to the ninth grade. Yeah. And we didn't get into a lot. Of, he, he just, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm, I'll have to talk to, to the headmaster at Shadyside because we don't pirate one another's yeah. faculty. And I, so when we went home, I said to Patty, why would I leave? There's nothing there for me, you know. And sure enough, the, early in October, he called and talked to George Follinsby, who was the head of Shadyside, who in the aftermath of the call called me into the office and said, what? And Cliff called me and I don't understand. He said, why in the world would you go to Swickley? And I said, I have no idea. But I said, uh, he prom I, I promised him that I would be willing to talk later on. So I'm going to have to go and see him. When I left Shadyside, I said to Patty that I can still remember, this is a long way to go to say no to somebody. <laughs> And when I came yeah. home, I said, sit down, sweetie, I got something to tell you. And that's when he told me that they were going to start the senior school, okay. and he would like me to consider being the head of the senior school. Now that, in and of itself, seemed so strange. I had no administrative experience. Yeah. I was a teacher, a coach, whatever, at uh, committees and all that yeah. stuff at at uh, shady side so <clears throat> uh, I said to him well I have to know more about this before I get into it I mean when when did all this start and how are they doing and this might be an answer to your other question yeah he said oh we've done the research okay he said we've had questionnaires go out to uh, lawyers, doctors, business people in the area through Moon Township down to Beaver in the immediate communities like Ben Avon and places like that. Yeah. So we have some sense of response. We, we obviously polled all our people down through the lower school and middle school about would they stay if there were such an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And we have some results from that. <clears throat> So we've done we've done the base work. So yes, we've come to the decision that it there there's enough response to really have the senior school. And he said, now some of the other things are, would be the, your responsibility yeah, in, in getting the school set up. So he, that satisfied me that they, they were working on it and I'd go back and I'd have questions and he said the other thing <clears throat> if you really uh, want to do it uh, we can go and visit other schools and see what their senior school setups are like mm -hmm. so we went to Philadelphia we went to Baltimore and we went to the school that I thought of as the one I admired the most, which was the Hawkins School in Cleveland, mm -hmm. yeah. which had just started on its own. Oh, it had wow. done the very thing that we were thinking to do. Okay. And they had 
uh, they're lower and middle in a certain part of town and they moved their yeah. senior school campus out of town mm -hmm. to a beautiful spot. Yeah. And uh, so we went and consulted with them uh, to, to get some ideas about, well, what went well, what didn't go well, what happened that you should have thought about, you know, this sort of thing. And that was a very, very valuable experience. I've been there. I've seen it, yeah. How many years ahead of Hawken, or how many years ahead was Hawken compared to where you guys were at the time? Oh, they, they had already, I think they had a senior class. So at least maybe three or four three years ahead. Three or four ahead. years. They had, they had gone through the initial stage. So when you were in Maine, and Cliff asked you, there were, he didn't tell you it was the senior school. He just said he wanted you to work for him. Yeah, he wanted. He said for the senior school. Oh, is that said, okay? We're going to start a senior school, and I'd like you to come and head the senior school. Head the senior school. But then at the time, there was a little bit of a plan. But, but you had to do, or did you guys do it together, or was it up to you, or how did that work? Oh, out? we did it. A lot of that stuff we did together because he had to see. My point was, he had to see all the things that went into having a senior school. Yeah. As he read it, he readily admitted, and uh, he said, I, 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 wouldn't, I don't understand those kids. I'm, 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 I'm good at the, the level I'm in, yeah. but I'm really anxious about the idea of having these teenage kids, you know, uh, which led to, to uh, another thing. I feel that I had an opportunity that very few guys had. Because he said to me, now that I don't understand those kids, I don't, I have no experience at high school stuff. Yeah. He said, and these were his words, he says, to me, that's your school. I have to know what's going on, but you're running the place. Okay. And, and, and he meant that. I mean, and, and, and he followed through on it. I think my favorite story is a mother who didn't quite understand in the very early stages of the senior school what those senior schools kids were doing, sitting outside on the grounds throwing a baseball around or something. And she demanded, and she drove in, demanded to see him, walked in and said, what, what in the hell is going on? Are they running a country club or what? <laughs> Because they were out playing. Yeah. That's fine. And Cliff looked at her and said, have you talked to Jim? She said, no. He said, well, then I'm not talking to you. Go over and find out from him what's going on. And I can't tell you how much I appreciated that. Yeah. That kind of support was incredible. That's great. Well, where was it physically located? Right over on the corner. So it was down where the current EC building no, it's right where the senior school oh, is now. right where it is now. So that structure... That tiny little thing. Now, really, okay. <laughs> it was... It, it was small. Yeah. But it, 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 it occupied that footprint. That's, right. where it, that's where it lived. They had thought of moving it up onto the heights where... Um, the, I'm trying to think of the, of the, the family's estate. It was empty, and they had the great big mansion oh. on this thing. They thought of having the campus up there and restoring the the house to, into the school building yeah. and everything. When they found out how much it would cost to do that, <laughs> that was one thing. And then some realists uh, talked about transportation. Well, what happens if you want kids to have phys ed in the wintertime yeah. or things like that? And, you know, buses going up and down the hill, yeah. that sort of thing. So after a, a lot of consideration, they decided, well, let's just put it on the campus and we'll put it as a, a far away from the lower and middle school to have a sense of separation. Yeah. So they'll know that it's a separate place. And, uh, and that's the way they did it. And they built this tiny little building on the corner. <laughs> and uh, as I used to kid Cliff, they never put a sign on it. I said it could have been the factory for something, you know, and uh, uh, I said, I should have known you weren't completely confident it was going to work because <laughs> <laughs> it had no name, the building with no name. 
a very nondescript thing, just yeah. a plain little red brick building. You know, that's great. So. Now, so you came from Shady Side yes. with no administrative experience. Not not school administration. I mean, school, you, but you had done committee work and yeah, probably department yeah. chair work. What do you think Cliff saw in you? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> now, this is getting out of hand. Uh, this is the way he claims it happened. He said, despite my idea that I was teasing him, and I, he said he had kept his eye on me. Okay. Well, they, we had the rainiest summer in Maine in years, and we had a thing where there were a few sunny days and the director of the camp came to me and said I want you to run a field day for the kids and have these events so I went to an, a, one of the other counselors who was the athletic director at Germantown Friends mm -hmm. and said what in the world is a field day <laughs> and he said Jimmy we'll, we'll do it together so we put this thing together and then he said now some of the guys have other duties so we're going to have to we may be a little bit short on help you know cliff walks into camp to get his mail i see him and i say we're going to have a field day do you think you could help out and he said sure i'll be glad to do that now according to him this is the way it goes yeah he said i had breakfast and i said to bobby who at the time was his wife i'm going down and help them on a the thing i'll be back for lunch you know, and that's it. so he said, well, let me tell you. He said, at 4.30 in the afternoon, I dragged my sorry ass up the hill, fell into a chair, asked Bobby to get me a drink. And he said, and I sat there and I thought about the day. And he said, and that little twerp ordered me around from the beginning of the day to the end. And the final insult was he handed me a pitchfork and said dig up the high jump pit <laughs> and he still hired you and he said and i thought now if he can order me around like that <laughs> he can run the senior school now that's he did he went through that routine at a meeting with the parents who said the same thing how in the world did you hire jim Gavin? how did you find jim Gavin? so that was his story but his idea was that he Again, he said, I thought I'd like to have somebody that really might approach it with a fresh point of view. He said, I wasn't sure, and obviously yeah. it was a, a risk you take, he said, but I saw enough of you to think that it would be okay. Well, you know? clearly the hire panned out, Jim. Well, so, clearly. The thing is. So, so when you came, um, how many faculty... How did that first year or two look? They looked great. <laughs> first of all, because I had those. When you think, uh, uh, we, we really talked a lot, the five of us, about what we wanted the school to be. So it was a five faculty? Five of us. Yep. The five main. And, and uh, Paul Rebar and Gil Levesque was the language teacher. Okay. They they had they had Swickley experience. They taught here, so okay. we had that to work with. Then we had Mary Rob and Duncan Denny. Mary Rob had college experience, okay. but Duncan Denny had taught in private schools in New England. So we had this beautiful combination of people, and all of whom had their own idea. Like if I had my own school, <laughs> this is what I would do, you know. And I would say the first big decision we made we knew was going to be a, an eye-opener and maybe cause a little bit of comment it caused a lot of comment it which was Mary Rob said these kids in high school they want to they don't want them to have any time where they if they're not in class they're in a study hall with a proctor in the study hall you know this kind of thing they they there's no idea that you have any kind of free time. They come to college and it's like they've been released yeah. and they're out there when they should be studying, they're throwing frisbees around or wasting their time or whatever. We've got to teach these kids how to use their time. Yeah. Even if it's only 45 minutes, we've got to get them used to the idea of time. The other, and that seems like a smaller thing, was in the, in the middle school, they used to have assignment sheets 
which had the assignment for every day on the sheet. Hand it to the kids? Yeah. Okay. The kids took it home, took so it home. their yeah. parents would know what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah. So we're doing away with those assignment sheets. Okay. They've got to know from day to day, the teachers can't keep to a, senior school teachers can't keep to a schedule like that, okay. you know. So they've got to make sure they, on their own, they know what they're supposed to be doing and when it's due and, you know, that kind of thing. So those were two changes right off the bat. That seems so trivial now. Oh, yeah. That was a big deal then? It was a big deal. That's so funny. It's a big deal. Now, I mean, now we'll wear our the schedule. First one, the first, <laughs> one of the first reactions we got from parents was, where are the assignment sheets? I mean, that seems so simple. But, yeah, of course, it meant so much in the middle school. Yeah. And so, Well, so did the first, the first senior school, did they initially move ninth grade into senior school? No. We so were, you were 10th we through You were 12. 10 and then you grew. Yeah. So those first 10th grade students. Yeah, ninth grade is only... In the senior school, it's only like five years old now. It's that long. It's been there for uh, more than that. Yeah, for a while. I'm not I've really lost sure. track of time now that That's I'm okay. away from it. So those be things. So when you were so clearly hired as head of senior school, what other responsibilities did you have? Did you continue to teach? I taught one class. I insisted on that because okay. I love teaching. Yeah. And I had one class, and I taught Latin, the advanced Latin classes. And I filled in, I was ready to fill in for any English or history teacher, okay. both of which things I love. But uh, the other thing was college guidance. Oh, yeah. So you did that as well? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we started, I started, uh, uh, again, Mary Robb was the one for that. Okay. Uh, she said, you know, uh, she was a Vassar graduate. And she had the director of admissions from Vassar was one of her classmates, came to visit her, and she invited me to dinner with them. And that woman said to me, Jim, you've got to get started now. Get out and start making your contacts now. So, and, and start going to the meetings, even though you don't have a senior class ready yet. Go oh, to the, getting ready, yeah. Go to the college board meeting, go to the... Yeah. The other local meetings, things like that. And so I did. So I, I went to, again, Cliff had to understand. I said, Cliff, you know, I've got to do this, which means I'm going to be away from school sometimes four or five days to go to a meeting and then visit colleges, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. And again, he was very, do what you have to do, kind of. Yeah, just get it done. Attitude, right. That's correct. So that the college guidance became, obviously, as we got larger and there were more, more students, uh, I had to split it somehow, and then Scott, Scott Carter came. Okay. And he, he, uh, he took half the class, and I took half the class. So you, okay. So we split it. Just going back, when you were hired, did you come to school and work a year first before no there was a, so you got you started the same year yeah as the first grade 10 yeah. that's crazy yeah that, how many kids were there do you remember 35 38 wow that's pretty good uh, a mixture of kids I forget how many of them were I'd have to look at the book uh, how many of them were ninth graders coming over and how, oh. how many were kids from outside yeah. which was the other big concern was how are these kids going to mix because the Sewickley kids had been by themselves all those years they they had no outside families yeah. you know and well who are these kids coming from these other places yeah. sort of thing well and again I, I feel we were very very fortunate because the kids who came in the mixture of personalities and other things, they fit right in. They, they work really, really well together. Uh, my heart is with that first class so much because when people talk about the success of the senior school, those first two classes in okay. particular made the, the culture of the senior school, the feeling of the senior school, 
the right the right thing. So when kids came in, they they got absorbed right away with the idea of well, this is the way things work over here, you know. Yeah. And and the inclusiveness was very much a part of it. They were very open to the. Although I have to say, when the first, second class came along, the the first group kept saying, "Who are these guys? What are they doing here?" Not really, but it was. A, we've got to show them what goes on over here. You know, had to train them. Yeah, we're we're the leaders of the we're pack. The well, to segue, so 2016 is the 50th anniversary of the yeah. first graduating class, um, which we're excited to celebrate this year. Right. Do you have any any stories stick out? from that first couple classes? Well, uh, there are a couple things I should mention. Uh, the other half of the picture was the parents. And those parents from the ninth grade who wanted their kids to stay, mm -hmm. they themselves had people criticizing, you mean you're going to let those kids stay? They're not oh. going to go away? Yeah which was so strong a tradition at the mm -hmm. place yeah. that those people, they were almost messianic in their uh, zeal to make the senior school work okay. in every way. And, and <laughs> Cliff again said to me, they came to him and said, that, that building is such a drab looking building, nothing but a little red brick thing. And said what I said, it could be the Continental Can Factory for all anybody <laughs> knows, you know. And they wanted to paint the brick. Yeah. And so he said, yeah, paint the brick. And the story there is that the painter is out there testing paint on the brick. A couple of senior school kids see him doing that and they said, what are you doing? And they said, well, they're going to paint the front of the building. And they come in to me and said, Mr. Cab, they're going to paint the front of the building. I said, yeah, they want to get rid of the trap brick. And, and so we had, by accident of fate, they, we had a, a, an assembly over here the next day. Then the lower and middle of there, my lip, 35, eight, and the kids are sitting over in the corner. The assembly is over, Cliff, and my kids don't move. And I'm standing in the back, and I'm thinking, wait a minute. And, and, Next thing I know, I see two of the kids get up and walk over to Cliff. And they went to Cliff and said, Mr. Nichols, we'd like to talk to you. And he said, yes, what do you want to do? And he said, they're going to paint the, bril they're going to paint the building. And he said, yes, and the parents. Are. He said, nobody asked us. <laughs> and again, Cliff, I'm telling you. He said, oh, my gosh, yeah. He said, well, listen, why don't you point two people and you be on that committee with Mrs. So and So and Mrs. So and So about picking the color for the for the building, and they went back. That's great. So <laughs> again, I got to come down. And I said, "What was that all about?" And again, Cliff goes. He said, "App Mason was right," and I said, oh, "Who's App Mason?" He said, "He's my best friend. He's the headmaster. I forget what school." And I told him we were going to have a senior school, and he looked at me and he said. Nichols, you're out of your mind. You've been living in paradise and you're trading it for hell. <laughs> <laughs> and he, <laughs> and, but it was the parents, and they came, again, I remember they, the first thing, they came, we're going to have a ski trip to Seven Springs. We have four chaperones, we're taking 15 kids. We have this and that. You get us a bus. That was all I had to do. They organized everything. Yeah. They said, there's no art in the building. You gotta have art in the building. And they had an appointment. We went downtown and picked, from some art gallery, picked standard prints. And they said, here's our plan. We're picking these prints, and we're gonna replace each one of these prints with an original work of art. Year, year, and that's the way they did it. That's great. I mean, it, it was that kind of involvement in the way they approached things that really were fundamental to the success of the school because you had that yeah. commitment and, and they were equally zealous about laying it on the parents who didn't send their kids away, didn't send their kids to us. 
and the proof of the pudding was in the next next year we had five kids who went away okay. come back oh really so they came back for the f during the year or at the end of the, the year they the came back the year, yeah with terrible tales about school or wherever they were you know <laughs> so and it was tough i'd go to cocktail parties and things like that and i would get cornered all the time by parents who were in the dilemma of, oh you know i remember uh one family said, if he doesn't go, if it go to the school, he'll be the only one in a line of goes back to grandfather so-and-so. Yeah. And the kid insisted that he wasn't going to go away to school. He wanted to stay. He wanted to stay. Well, and there was that tradition, right? Go yeah. to grade nine, then go to boarding school. Yeah. It was deep set in the place. Yeah. And that's what my friends at, at Shadyside laid on me all the time. Ah, uh, they tried that before. It'll never work. I said they never tried it before. They said yes. So I said to Cliff, "What is that?" And he said, "One year we had four girls who were too young. Or they were a year ahead of themselves, and the parents didn't want them to go away. Okay. So we let them stay and changed their schedule for the. It was like an extra ninth grade, in uh, the sense that they had to stay. They stayed an extra year, but it wasn't a formal. We're starting a ninth grade." It was an accommodation to four families who wanted right. help that way. Because I had heard that. I heard that there was a maybe a try, but that was the yeah. story. Yeah. So That's, you that was a try. That so was clearly, a, the students, the faculty, the parents, everybody was invested oh, in the success. It, it was tremendous. Yeah. It's funny too. The artwork tradition still continues. If you walk through the senior school, the yeah. it's all kids' artwork. Yeah. That's well, great. and they, you know, they spent a lot of money. <laughs> in fact, there's. I shouldn't tell you this story. They, we had all that original artwork, and the people over here got upset and said, oh, they're spending money for artwork. Home and school spending money for artwork over there. What about us? So they went, and the home and school said, oh, they're right. And so they went, and they spent a lot of money uh, for a, a painting. It so happened that one time I came over, and I would, every once in a while, stop in the, the faculty room down here, and I went to hang up my coat, and in the, in the closet where I went to hang up my coat was this expensive painting. And I said, well, they, nobody over here liked it. So that's where it ended up. <laughs> so it ended up, in the, it ended up in the senior school. And then that's the, we had our painting and they took it away. And I said, yeah, I was, I, come on, I find it in the, the coat rack coat closet. So how many years were you the head of the senior school? 63 to 89. So that many? That's a long time. It is. That's a long time. What, what stories pop Ooh. into your mind? I mean, that's a, that's a big loaded question, Jim. It's a big question. Oh, gee. In particular, that that first faculty, Mary Robb started the library. Yeah, she had that. She was tremendous that way. She was the oldest member of the faculty, and she had the greatest sense for the kids. She just had a a, a way about her, and I remember one of the kids. Uh, who thought of himself as a, a really one of the smartest, brightest, <laughs> whatever. And she, they had a writing assignment, and he he thought he could just rip something off and wrote it. <laughs> and Mary handed back the paper <laughs> and said with a note on it, who do you think you're fooling? You ripped this off in five minutes and, <laughs> and put a, like a, a D on it, you know. <laughs> and, and the kid came in later, he said, he said, she saw through my, us like there. She just knew what was going on. And I said, she did. She was, she was that way. Gil Levesque was a very emotional guy. Uh, 
another tradition that we started is we had the morning morning assembly every morning instead of having a bulletin where you read the announcements of the yeah. day, we met in the library. The kids, sports could give their results. Yeah, the kids could announce their meetings. Faculty could do whatever they wanted, and you know yeah. that kind of thing. And and Gil Levesque was always he had these wonderful little stories and messages. It wasn't, uh, and, and the the kids enjoyed it. But, and I could still remember he used to get out, he'd hold his hands up like this, and he, he, the one I remember most, <clears throat> he took one of the Beatles songs <laughs> and used the Beatles song as a base for for his remarks, and the kids loved it. Yeah, I mean it was just, uh, and. Uh, so he, Paul Rebar was a guy that I could ask. Usually they had a maintenance man who would drive a bus if they were going on a field trip. And the guy would pick, and I'd, I could go to Paul at any time of the day or night and say, Paul, the, the driver is sick and we have to go to Western Reserve tomorrow. Do you think he's... Oh, okay. He said, I'll have to tell Polly that's the right. He asked him anything. He could do anything. He was so committed to the kids, you know, for... Yeah. So, and, and Duncan Denny was a character in and of himself. The kid got a an answer right, you know, had asked the, the kid to do something to get on the right. He'd leap up in the air, click his heels together. <laughs> You make some remark the kids used to say, someday Mr. Denny's going to break a leg. <laughs> so, so. Something occurred to me. So 35 or 30, yeah. middle 30 kids, what kind of extracurriculars were there? They weren't, you know, well, they're the typical clubs you had to have somebody run. That was another crisis. Who's going to run the school newspaper? Oh, okay. So for the first couple of years, our kids just worked together with the middle school kids. Okay. And then we, then senior school became the editors. Okay. You know, but things like that. Uh, we we had soccer, basketball, and baseball. Okay. Were the sports, and we brought on. on we played JV teams for the first two years, and then we had seniors. Then we had a varsity team. Okay. And then <clears throat> tennis, oh, I should have said tennis. We didn't have golf. We had tennis also. Okay. And, but what we did, we did, we did well with the, the few number of kids. How about the, what, like plays or musicals or? Oh, we had plays every year. Still, yeah. And the, that was the other thing that, that's a thing that I loved about coming here. Was at Shady Side, that kind of thing was minimized. Okay. They had one concert a year. They had one play, which they struggled to get because of the way they the kids worked. They had more. Uh, they had uh, in, the, in those days, Shady Side had four dormitories going full tilt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when we came here. They already had the music was already very much in place. Sure. So the idea was, they. I think it was the second year. After the second year, decided to have a somebody do music and art for the senior school. Okay. Up until then, we used the middle school teachers. Mm -hmm. And so there was that combination of things. As far as scheduling was concerned, you had to, we had to coordinate with the middle school okay. on those things. Well, then the other difficulty was we got our own. Well, then we had still think of time. Mm -hmm. And we had the old art building, this big old mansion okay. that uh, served as the art building. And uh, we had the theater over here, though. And yeah. Yeah, right. Was here. Know. What, I want to shift gears a little bit. Because I've also seen this in action. You're legendary at remembering kids' names. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, and I've seen it. So, is it a gift? Do you work at it? It's a combination of both. It is. It's just that, uh, you know, again, this, 
this goes back. My mother emphasized to us that if we met somebody and we shook hands and uh, you know that kind of thing, and she said, and when you shake hands and everything, she said, when you walk away, repeat the person's name to yourself so you know who you you'll, you'll remember. Which was true. <laughs> I yeah. got used to doing that. And the other thing was that I thought to myself, I took it as sort of a uh, part of my responsibility. Like at Shady Side, I knew every kid, every kid on campus, and so that you were with those, especially the boarders. You were with them day and night. Yeah. I could see any kid and say, "Hey, Bill, how you doing?" Doing, the, you know. And you could see that they they appreciated the idea that you did you knew them and recognized them. I didn't do quite as well doing the lower school kids, but I did when I was here. I would learn a lot of the middle school kids' names, so that if I just saw them walking, and, uh, you know, to be able to recognize them and tell them. Did you did you look at photos and memorize? Is that how no, you worked it? No, I just from day to day just just keep working. You know, and sometimes if I forgot, I'd say, you know, I forgot, tell me who you are, you know, and they'd tell me. And I think they even appreciated the fact you'd stop them and ask them. And talk to them. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were there to senior right. school. That's great. Right. No, but it was a blessing in a, in, in a way. Not only with the kids in school, but when I would go to meetings and things like that to see people remember who they were and, you know, see them again next year. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I know just from being at alumni, uh, the party this year, and the fact that you remembered. But you know, I got to tell you. Jim, man, that's pretty good, man. That's fading. I think I'm on the gap between Alzheimer's and dementia here. Really? I, I, you were still pretty good, though. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's so, it's so it was even better before? Oh, it bothers the devil out of me Does that it? I can't remember these kids. That's, you're still pretty good, Jeez. though. You're still pretty good. Well, we're winding down. Okay. Any other thoughts about um, the senior school in those early days? Um, especially as we think of that first graduating class. Well, I think there were a number of things. I knew in my heart and mind that people were going to look at that graduating class and say, where did they go to college? And where did the kids who went away to school go to college? Mm -hmm. And were we at all in the ball game as far as being, since we were a new school, yeah. did, did, we, did, did we have uh, any kind of success, what, what happened with those kids? And, and we, did, we did well. Uh, we had, you know Stanford and Williams and things like that, but I, I, there was a, a thing going on at the time which we fought against tremendously. For the girls, there were so many parents who, who thought they'll send the girls. They had a lot of those little two-year colleges up in New England. Mm -hmm. Let them go there. You know, oh, two year. They, the idea of going to a four-year school or going for any of those competitive places was not part of the picture. And we had to, we had to, you know, we just had to re-educate. And I can't tell you how often the attitude was for girls yeah. to the idea that, look, you're talented, you're good, and you, you should be looking at, you know, a higher level. Yeah, different time. It, it was a different time. Different time. <laughs> it was a, definitely yeah. a different time. Yeah. The worst years, I would say, were the years when the, all the Vietnam years, when the country itself was so discombobulated and okay. upset. Yeah. Uh, a scene I will remember is when they had the draft... We had uh, television sets in the library and in the hallway really? so the kids could watch the, on TV the draft, and they knew wow. when their birthday was. 
and were they going to were they number 26 or were they number 1402 it was a wow. traumatic time yeah i would say so there were a number of those things yeah uh, so the, some of those things but there were so many plus pluses yeah obviously i mean it, this was such a a beautiful place i mean the support of the school the support of the headmaster uh, the quality of the kids and the fa and the faculty to me i mean i would go to be meetings and the public school teacher and the guys and hear these incredible stories and I'm, i'd sit in the corner and think my god i am so lucky <laughs> yeah you know because there were so there were they were so good and i think they felt they really did feel so committed to the school. One last thing: the biggest, one of the biggest decisions we made, which I, I knew was going to be controversial, <laughs> was we felt after a number of years that the kids were becoming so grade conscious, grade grubbing. I mean, if I said it's a sunny day today, they'd say, "Is that going to be on the test tomorrow?" Yeah. And the faculty, in general, we just felt that way, and they said, no, we've got to do something, you know? We've yeah. got to get them out of this mood, because this college thing is hanging over their sure. heads and all that stuff. So we decided we were going to take the month of May and turn it into, into a completely different curriculum. All the regular courses would end at the end of April. May would be a whole new set, of, and it gave the teachers a chance to teach Course, a course that they always wanted to teach. Yeah. Like Paul Rebar loved the Civil War. Okay. And he wanted to teach, especially, you know. Or the kids who came in from the public school who were behind in math and wanted to be able to get into calculus or AP. Yeah. Yeah. It gave them, May gave them the chance to do, they called it Blitz, Blitz Trig. <laughs> Blitz Trig. <laughs> yeah. You know, to get, get them up. So we did, we did that, we, we put that together. And I went to Cliff and said, now look, this is a whole new ball game, you know. And again, I told you already. Yeah. He said, if you, if you think it's gonna, let's do it and see what happens. We will just work at it. Well, it went over like gangbusters. Yeah. And, uh, and it lasted for maybe nine years. Yeah. And then we decided there was too much going on that we're losing that month made everything else they crammed too much in the other part of the year. Yeah. But it was a controversial thing, May program. One of the fathers, again an executive in downtown Pittsburgh, calls me up and says, what is this? And I, and he, uh, I said, and he, he used blitz, yeah, blitz trig, you know. And I, I said, well, look, I'll make a deal. Let's go through the program. If at the end of the program you're still unhappy, I'll go to Cliff and get you a month's tuition back. And he said, okay, it's a deal. A week later he calls me up and he says, the deal is off. I said, the deal is off? What happened? He said, well, he said, my son comes home and we're sitting at the dinner table. And he looks to me dead in the eye and says, what makes you think democracy is the best government? I happen to believe socialism would be a lot better. At which point he said, I practically swallowed my tongue. And, <laughs> and, and we had this discussion in which I felt I was already losing. <laughs> and he said, and, and I'm telling you right now, that I'm calling you right now because I'm sitting here. I have canceled two appointments while I'm reading this book to answer this <laughs> question that my son, he said, so it must be doing the job, you know. And But again, it was a controversial thing. Yeah. And that's what I loved about the, about the, the whole concept was we, we didn't have anybody saying, well, we never did it that way. Yeah. So we could do what, what we felt was right and and would be most beneficial. But we also knew that it was going to cause some comment and some reaction because they had never done it that way before. 
and people aren't always happy about new things. So, yeah, you know, the freedom that the kids had initially, things like the May program, those kind of things. People, you know, they hadn't experienced in their own education. My high school wasn't like that. Yeah, you know that sort of thing. So those were the challenges, and and because of the quality of the faculty and the response of the parents, they they worked. It worked. And I'll add one more thing to end it. And the quality of you, Jim. Oh, so I it know was, you're here in front of me, but it was so easy yeah. to lead those people. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I, I used to feel that I got so much more credit than I deserved because they were the, not only were in many cases the instigators of things, but <laughs> the ones who really made it work. I mean, you had to know that there were some of the faculty that said, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah sure. That kind of thing. So, but once we were in it, they, look, this is what we're doing and we're going to do it, you know. Good. Well, Jim, thank you very much. Okay.